Let me start with the story. In the beginning, there were three. Pavle, the ex-footballer, Katia, the journalist, and Bruno, the, the professional chef. They came together during the siege purely by chance and used their collective skills to improve their survival chances. Always low on supplies and usually having one or more go hungry each day. Then Marco arrived, seeking shelter. The survivors knew they would struggle to support a fourth person, but welcomed him anyways. Marco then proved his worth after bringing home more food and medicine in one night than Pavle had managed, managed in a week. He helped the group not only survive, but flourish. He even at one point rescued a girl under the assault of the drunken soldier, earning him the status of hero among the people of po Pogoren. Then one night, he went scavenging in the dangerous area, known to be inhabited by brutal bandits. While searching through a cabinet, he was spotted. The group was devastated by his death. They never really recovered. A little over two weeks later, the siege had been lifted. The group had survived and all went back to try to pick up where they left off before the war. Except for one whose body silently lies in a shallow, unmarked grave. Rest in peace, Marco. You will be missed. My name is Kacper Kwiatkowski, and I am a co-owner of Vial Monarch Studio. But before, I was one of the designers and writers of This War of Mine, the game released the last year by 11-Bit Studios. What I've just read to you was a Steam review of this game. It was a lit literal description of the events that happened when uh, the user called Risky Briseness was playing the game. This story was not something we designed at 11-bit studios. In this war of mine, the player controls a group of civilians in the, ci in the modern city under siege. They are neither soldiers nor heroes fighting evil or solving some great mystery. They're just people like me and you, ordinary people with ordinary concerns, such as ensuring they have something to eat, trying to stay in good health, and uh, helping their, their loved ones. Except all of those become hell of a lot harder when the conflict breaks out. Do you think it would make a good premise for a moving story? If you do, it simply means you are human beings. Because, because we, human beings, are in love with stories for as long uh, as the history of mankind can remember. We love cheerful stories that make us smile. But equally, we love tales of despair, sadness, misery, probably because they make us think. You all know this feeling of what's going to happen next, am I right? You might even felt obsessed with a story once in a while, with a book, with a movie, Game of Thrones, newest season. There's so, some amazing power in stories. No wonder why we see it used basically everywhere in marketing, religion, politics, and games here are no exception. I think Elements of storytelling have been used in games since around the time you learned those bastards, bastard space invaders want to destroy the Earth. That's a story. However, during the development of this war of mine, we didn't consider it to be a story-driven game. Only, uh, only after it had been released, I started thinking about different interpretation of this term. It was because of something I noticed in a large part of the reactions to the game. Among them were stories. Dozens of stories the players and the reviewers were retelling when just describing their experiences of the game. The interesting thing is we didn't write those stories. We didn't design them. We didn't write any script. Uh, we didn't hire actors to read the dialogues. As a matter of fact, 
we barely had any dialogue in the game, not in a typical sense. Until recently, I had a very simple understanding of a story-driven game. That it is a game that has a gameplay component and a story component. Story sections uh, like dialogues or cutscenes that push the plot forward. Uh, and I must admit, I played some brilliant games that fit this description, including one of my favorite games ever. Final Fantasy VII. I love this game, but uh, at the same time, I can see one of its major flaws, perhaps the only flaw of this game, that its brilliant story was told mostly in the game, and barely any attempt was made to tell it with the game. In other words, there's in Final Fantasy VII, there's a very strong, strong distinction be between those two parts. This is the gameplay, and this is the story. They barely talk to uh, each other. Of course, I must give Final Fantasy VII a credit for a remarkable sense of freedom. You can go nearly anywhere. You can explore places, learn about characters at your, your own pace. But at the end of the day, when you're grinding another monster in a random encounter, you're not really feeling that this fight tells an interesting story, do you? For me, it's rather like, like a strange kind of book where you're enjoying a story and once in a while you must solve a Sudoku puzzle to learn what will happen next. The book might be amazing and you, you might really enjoy Sudoku, but still, this combination is far from telling a story with a game. Of course, Final Fantasy VII is, a, is an old title, and since then we've seen many good uh, attempts to improve this concept of a so-called story-driven game. Like br branching plots in games such as Mass Effect and, of course, The Witcher, or uh, one of my favorite games, Uncharted, it basically blurs, blurs this distinction between the gameplay and the story by bringing much of the story content during the gameplay. But still, the distinction is visible. This is gameplay. The decisions you make here are meaningless to the narrative. Let's face it. Uncharted. When you're killing an enemy number 500, it is meaningless to the story. It doesn't matter. It's just, it's just a Sudoku puzzle you've just solved to learn what will happen next. And one might argue that this, uh, this, this problem doesn't exist in games featuring branching plots like The Witcher, where you can really influence what will happen using your decisions. But I think it still carries some, some of those problems. Uh, because you still have this, these gameplay sections where you're making decisions irrelevant to the story. You're, for example, killing another wolf or, or, or another strange animal or, or monster. Your decisions in games like uh, The Witcher are shaped uh, on a, another layer, as I call it, big story decisions. Those are special decisions that shape how we, the plot will uh, unravel. But it's still n not a big problem. The biggest sin in this more traditional approach to story-driven games is when the story and the gameplay are, doesn't, uh, don't, very, don't like each other very much. Have you heard the term ludonarrative dissonance? Who have? Yeah, so you probably know what I'm talking about. Uh, let's go back to... Oh, it's already animated. It spoiled the surprise <laughs> uh, because it had an animation. In, uh, I'm talking about Uncharted because 
I love this game, so I feel privileged to, to hate it at the same time. Uh, so in Uncharted, you have one character whom I called, whom I call Story Drake. He's a witty adventurer, good at cracking jokes. But in gameplay, you meet Gameplay Drake, who's a remorseless killing machine. He's basically a maniac, good at cracking other people's skulls. And you could probably name hundreds of examples where the gameplay and the story are like developed by different teams, stitched together in the probably last month of the development to make it work somehow. That's little narrative dissonance. In this war of mine, we couldn't afford dealing with such problems. We wanted the players to be fully invested emotionally to the game. We didn't want them to constantly switch between gameplay sections and story sections, not to, not to mention the risk of discrepancies. We were so far from this typical story-driven approach that we weren't even explicitly addressing story in our discussions. discussions. In other words, we were rarely speaking about story during the design of this war of mine. Instead, we wanted to focus on emotions, credibility, and consistency as driving forces for our game. And from a wide variety of story-related re tools, we wanted to focus on one particular thing, on having a strong theme. The tri tricky thing was that this theme couldn't be easily supported by having just cutscenes or dialogues uh, or just other, other way to tell a linear pre-written plot. Because the theme was what would you do if it really happened, you. The player, the member of the audience, not some imaginary character in this game. So, ultimately, instead, instead of looking for some sophisticated recipe for a story-driven game, we decided to base the game on a most basic, most fundamental property that makes game a game making decisions. And I, I am not talking about those big story decisions from games with branching plot. I mean most basic minute to minute, second to second gameplay decisions. That's why it's hard actually to call this war of mine a story driven game. From the very beginning it was designed as a gameplay driven game. But with gameplay that was meant to make sense makes sense in the context of the setting, of the theme, of the mood in this game, relying on mechanics that were very deliberately crafted to symbolize real issues of the, and real emotions of the situation the game portrays. It turned out that the, the result was a game where players were making decisions not just in terms of beating the game, discovering the mechanics, but in terms of what those decisions symbolized in the context of the narrative. The tools were always there. I think the games industry was chasing the movie-like experience, it, and it just forgot the power it had at its disposal since the very beginning of the medium. The games were always about making decisions, long before the race of uh, branching plots, uh, multiple endings, moral choices, etc. Uh, whether you move left or right, whether you jump or fall, shoot a fireball or block uh, the attack, those are decisions tiny little gameplay decisions that, in reality, often happen to be virtually meaningless to the narrative. Why not use this tool to tell a story? To tell a story that doesn't try to be equal to a movie, even a good one, but tries to work on its own terms, 
tell a story that wouldn't work in a non-interactive medium, such as movies. Have any of you ever felt guilty when watching a movie? And not because you chose to watch Fifty Shades of Grey, but be because the story made you feel uh, ashamed of yourself, wishing the things were different. It was something I uh, discovered when I was asked by our design director, Michał Drozdowski, uh, to research emotions. I was to name emotions that could be evoked by specific events in this war of mine, with preferably with examples from a movie. Example of similar scene, similar emotion. I got stuck with those very quickly, because what I realized is, was that some emotions couldn't be accessed by movies, but we, game developers, have access to those emotions. Guilt was a mank of them, feeling of guilt, because to evoke guilt, you must hold the audience member responsible for the events on screen. As I mentioned before, the tools were always there. We just need to learn how to make better use of them. Uh, this might require breaking some old habits. You won't be able to just pick an idea for a story and pick um, any old existing gameplay scheme, mix them together, add some meaningful gameplay decisions, and here you go. You have a narrative experience. Say you want to have, you want to make an adaptation of a movie called Whiplash, and you decide to choose a first-person shooter mechanics to tell the story. Not a very good idea, in my opinion. But I think it is almost always possible to invent game mechanics that will suit your story, that will help tell the story, that will become become integral part of the story. Our take with this war of mine was to find the mechanics that will, will symbolize, that will become symbols of the sit situation of, that we wanted to portray. In this war of mine, every part of the gameplay is part of the story. Any decision you make can be a part of the story. There is no distinction between big story decisions and small gameplay ones. At any point of the game, of the gameplay, of your interactions with the game, you may happen to influence the, uh, the fate of the characters, how they talk, how they relate to each other, uh, how they feel, if they will survive the war. I think this is where the story emerges. This is what made the players think about those cho uh, their choices, not just to beat the game, but to immerse themself, themselves in, in this setting and to act this story. Like uh, this young woman from our, our playtest session, she often stole food from other characters, but she always left a few portions. And not because there was some achievement for leaving portions of food to stolen uh, uh, families. Uh, not because any other calculable benefit. We believe she did so only because it made her feel a little bit better in this particular story. But feeling a little bit worse can al also be interesting, right? Each of you could probably name a book where something bad happens, something really bad, and you feel really depressed. But finishing the book, you think, what a great book. I love this book, even though I feel terrible. Uh, games, however, I think I are not very good at using negative emotions, which is especially visible with the notion of failure. Say, if a the main character dies in a good book, it's usually a huge climactic moment with a proper build-up that makes you sweat and bite your fingernails. Meanwhile, in games, yeah, this is the main character of the game dying in a game. Not, 
not a par particularly good way for the main character to go, am I right? And enemy number 501 just managed to reduce Drake's health bar to zero. His body is awkwardly hitting the floor, and you must go back to the last checkpoint. I think it is nowhere near a climactic moment from a book. I think it's rather uh, this moment, when your book falls down and you're annoyed and cursing while looking for the page you were last reading. I think games are too open-handed with failure, uh, especially when with killing characters. In games, too often, killing the main character is just a convention, a conventional way of saying, you, the player, you just made some minor mistake. Uh, there was something interesting in this war of mine related to this issue. Something I discovered when I was watching a stream. A guy called Indy was streaming this war of mine, and he wasn't doing very well, I must say. But the, his playthrough ended in a very thrilling manner. He let most of the characters die very quickly, including poor Katya. Uh, and there was only one man, one lonely man in a city torn by war. His new friends just died, one because of the wounds, one because of the hunger. Uh, and then from the underlying calculations of the game systems, what emerged was a few days depression of this last man standing, which ultimately ending with, with uh, him committing a suicide. He took his life. This moment left this guy streaming the game, Indy, speechless for a brief second. It was then when I realized what we managed to achieve. It might be even the most interesting moment in, in his playthrough, which is completely valid. Because it wasn't just a mere punishment for a mere mistake in the game. It was a strong finale of a story. Of the story this player was uh, basically building with his decisions. How we handle the failure, I think, is one of the conventions we, the game developers, are just used to, and which we use in our games by default, with little consideration about the, their place in the narrative. Other example is the language. Sorry for this. Sorry. Oh, thank you. Uh, yeah. The language. Take, take, for instance, the language. Games develop this unique kind of meta-narration, this strange language with strange terminology, which usually speaks directly to the player, just ignoring the story layer of the game. I mean things like, would you like to save your game? Press space to continue. DPS. Uh, area of effect. Experience points, my favorite. What are experience points in your story? Did they have experience points in the Middle Earth? I think the worst we can do is just to assume, assume that this is just a game. This is how we make games. No need to change anything. What if we could try, at least try to change something? We made some attempt, a, attempts with this war of mine to change those conventions. We wanted to avoid as much of this standard gaming gibberish as we could and to, um, f to integrate as much of the writing in the game with the story. So those are s simple things. For example, we e cr crafting. This word crafting was changed in our games to simply making an inventory to our things. No one has inventory in their houses. We have things. Th this is how people are talking. Also, this war of mine is rarely speaking to the player directly. Uh, I mean the game as the game. Rather, characters are speaking or writing or, or thinking. Even things like item descriptions are, 
are written like something a character could write in his notebook. It's not a game uh, uh, explaining something to the gamer. Those are small details. Uh, they didn't require a lot of additional work, but I think they greatly contributed to the overall experience. I think games industry is generally held back by this approach of uh, this is just a game, this is how games are made. And according to this approach, if you want to have a better story in your game, you probably need to hire a better writer and better actors. And that's it. I think uh, this, of course, could work, could produce amazing results, and it does. But only if you're not aiming uh, for anything more than a movie-like experience. I think if we want to do better, we need to understand the, our unique language of telling stories. I was once listening to Genesis with my dad. I think it was Foxtrot album. Uh, definitely, it was one, with, w one of those with Peter Gabriel on vocals. And my dad told me that when he was my age or younger, he liked to just lie down, play the tape. They had tapes back then. And imagine different stories that came to him with the music of uh, Genesis. Uh, mind you, however, that we're from Poland. And back then, my dad... Uh, didn't understand much of the lyrics. It was the music that uh, made this narrative experience emerge. Uh, the structure of those songs, the rhythm, the melody, the manner of Peter Gabriel singing. I, I think someone might have, might have said in the earlier days of rock and roll music that if, uh, if you want to have uh, if you want to have a story in your song, you just w need to hire someone who will write you good lyrics. Then bands like Genesis or Pink Floyd came. They could, what they really were doing is making stories with the music. You didn't, uh, uh, even if you didn't understand the lyrics, you could, with uh, bands like Genesis or Pink Floyd, you could experience passion, danger, adventure, loss, or, or sadness with the music itself. I think any medium could be considered mature as a form of storytelling when it stops limiting to just borrow from the others and starts using means that are unique to this particular medium, starts telling stories that wouldn't work elsewhere. elsewhere. The good news, we are already past those early awkward days of rock and roll music. We have games, last year's brought some brilliant examples. We have games like The Wolf Among Us, which uses this mechanic of uh, big story decisions as, as the main gameplay mechanic. Or we have games like The Vanishing of Ethan Carter, Gun Home, and similar titles. They use this decades-old feature just to move around freely in a 3D environment. They use it to tell a story. Or we have uh, 80 Days, brilliant games. You must play 80, gays, uh, 80 Days. I'm dead serious, play 80 days. It basically, it lets you shape your own adventure around the world with your own decisions during the game. And there was Papers, Please, great game. Uh, by the way, a great influence for this war of mine. Uh, for me, however, it's still not enough. If we want to do more, if we want to... Uh, uh, we. If we want to do better, we need to put some more effort. Maybe n then we can have our version of Dark Side of the Moon. So does this mean we all no need to just stop what we're currently doing and focus on delivering unique narrative experience, preferably with mature, uh, m serious themes? Not necessarily. I think 
we, we could start with three simple steps that, in my opinion, could uh, improve any game on the field of the narrative. First, what do you want to say with your game? Ask yourself. It doesn't mean you have to write a plot. Plot is not everything for a story. You could, uh, you could think what kind of theme would you like to have in your game? What kind of setting? What kind of mood? And make them consistent. Second, do the player actions contribute to telling the story? In other words, are they consistent with what you decided in the first step? Uh, is, are the player actions explained in the story? Justified? Third, can gameplay information relate to the story? For example, do you need your game to speak directly to the player, or, or can you convey more gameplay-related information just in the game world? And can you use a vocabulary that's more suitable for your game, I mean things like experience points, uh, than just those stuck terms used everywhere? Uh, those are not some drastic uh, measures. I think, it, on the other hand, I think those are more important than having a, a well-written plot. A plot is not a must. Well-written, pre-written plot is not a must for a game. Uh, and also, those steps won't turn your game upside down. I do want to see things turned upside down once in a while. I do want to see someone improving what we've done with this war of mine. And most of all, I do want to see more mature games that tell stories, not just inside of them, but with them. That they tell stories with the gameplay. But I don't listen to Genesis all the time. I still have a lot of catchy, radio-friendly songs on my playlist. Just like I still play games where you're just tough guy punching monsters, or simple mobile games to play on a bus, or, or multiplayer games to uh, compete or cooperate with your friends. Uh, actually, the game I'm currently making with uh, my studio, Vile Monarch, is closer to this side of the spectrum than to this war of mine. Because, all in all, I don't think we need to change the experiences the game can give us, the games can give us. I just think we can try find more. And this is the moral of this story. Thank you. Thanks. That's if you want to discover more about designing this war of mine, uh, uh, for a start, I recommend you to check this lecture on GDC Vault by Paweł Miechowski. Thanks. Okay, thank you, Kasper. Uh, does anyone have any questions? Someone want to interact right now? Someone want to take the microphone and say something to Kasper? Oh. Here we have. Kaspar, are you ready? This is. Uh, I have got a question. <clears throat> uh, it seems that uh, this idea of uh, gameplay driven story is very cool, but it sounds very complex at the same time. So I've got a question. Do you have any general tips on how to manage all those branching and interlocking story branches, if and else's? How, how to put this system together? How? Katsper, how to start? Tips and tricks for people who want to use this complex system. Do you have any tool that can help or tip how to start? Uh, my, uh, actually, one of the last slides with those three steps was my tip for starting, for improving our games on a narrative level. But th there is no some... Uh, one, uh, one way to, to do things. I think it's just, it's rather a matter of approach to our games than uh, to discover uh, particular tools. Uh, and I think those experiments are very young, so we, we still need to discover. 
We s still need to discover more, more interesting ways to tell games using gameplay mechanics. Okay, thanks.